Good afternoon. I'm Teresa Ladrigan Welpley, the director of the Bannon Institutes and the Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education here at Santa Clara. And it's my privilege to welcome all of you to the 2016-2018 Bannon Institute, which is focused around the question and call, is there a common good in our common home, a summons to solidarity? St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order, expressed a view dating back to Aristotle that the common good is linked with a higher order. The more universal the good is, said Ignatius, the more it is divine. Ignatius charged his companions to help souls, advancing the common good for the greater glory of God. In the thick of the U.S. election season, the advancement of the common good has become a pressing global, national, and with recent events at Santa Clara campus concern. Today we convene the third week of our four-part Bannon Institute series on the common good, unpacking what is at stake for economic justice and the common good in 2016. Economic justice has been a central focus of Catholic social teaching since Pope Leo the 13th issued the first major social encyclical of the church, Rerum Novarum, in 1891 on capital and labor. In the wake of the Industrial Revolution, this teaching focused on the rights and dignity of laborers and called for the protection of private property, private associations, as well as a preferential option for the poor, the universal destination of goods, and a just wage. Over the last century or so, teachings on economic justice have persisted as central to the concerns of the Catholic Church, with the U.S. bishops publishing a pastoral letter in 1986, Economic Justice for All, in which they addressed each one of us, asking, how will my economic decisions serve human dignity and the common good? On the 100th anniversary of Rerum Novarum, Pope John Paul II delivered the encyclical Santissimus Annus to all people of goodwill, renewing the church's teachings on economic justice within free markets while urging a preferential option for the poor as an ethical imperative. Most recently, Pope Francis, in his apostolic letter, Evangelii Gaudium, continued to sound the alarm on economic injustice noting how persistent inequality and poverty have undermined inclusive and participatory democracy, calling for the development of three fundamental instruments for the full social inclusion of those most in need, education, access to health care, and employment. In the Dao Si on Care for Our Common Home, Pope Francis reiterates these concerns, urging, quote, to claim economic freedom while real conditions bar many people from actual access to it, and while possibilities for employment continue to shrink, is to practice a double speak, which brings politics into disrepute. In view of the common good, there is an urgent need for politics and economics to enter into a frank dialogue in the service of life, especially human life." End quote. How might our politics and economics enter into this frank dialogue in the service of life, human dignity, and the common good in 2016. Is there a common good in our common home? We enter these pressing questions today with two members of the Bannon Institute Faculty Collaborative on Economic Justice and the Common Good, William Sundstrom and Laura Nichols. Dr. William Sundstrom is professor in the Department of Economics in the Levy School of Business and Bannon faculty fellow in the Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education. He earned his BA from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and his PhD from Stanford University, both in economics. He's the author of numerous scholarly publications in economics and economic history. His current research areas include the causes and consequences of poverty and income inequality in the Silicon Valley region, as well as relevant policy responses, the impact of climate change and poverty on food security and well-being of smallholder farmers in Nicaragua, and the development and impact of public libraries in the United States. 
Professor Sundstrom has taught a wide range of courses in economics, most recently in the areas of data analysis and econometrics, environmental economics, and the economics of race, ethnicity, and gender. He also serves as the faculty director of undergraduate business programs in the Levy School of Business, president-elect of the Santa Clara University Faculty Senate, and chair of the Bannon Institute's Faculty Collaborative on Economic Justice and the Common Good. So please join me in welcoming Professor Sundstrom to open today's event, What is at Stake for Economic Justice in 2016? Inequality in Global, National, and Local Perspective. Professor Sundstrom. Well, thank you very much. Teresa, and thank you all for coming. This is a, a great turnout. It's really uh, a pleasure and an honor to talk about these really important issues uh, here at Santa Clara in this most uh, unusual and at times discouraging 2016 election season. Um, let me say a little bit about the uh, Economic Justice and the Common Good Faculty Collaborative that uh, Teresa mentioned. Uh, just a moment ago. Uh, this is, has brought together uh, six faculty from Santa Clara University to uh, discuss mutual interests and uh, projects in the area of economic justice, quite broadly defined, I should say. Uh, this is an amazing uh, array of, of uh, research and teaching projects uh, that uh, these folks are going to be involved in, including myself. Uh, my project is called Santa Clara Income and Poverty Studies Initiative. From Vision to Reality. Um, we also have in our collaborative uh, Professor Ann Baker from the Political Science Department. I see her over there at the side uh, talking about the policy and partisan preferences of donors seeking surrogate representation. Uh, that's all about money and politics in case the, uh, the title's a little uh, obscure. John Ifcher, my colleague in the Economics Department at Santa Clara University, uh, will be working on a project affirming the common good in economic pedagogy. Now I should have, I'm not clicking to the pictures here. There we go. Uh, there's John. Uh, an alternative approach to teaching Econ 1. Uh, he just presented our first seminar to our group uh, the other day and uh, got things off to a very good start talking about this interesting topic of uh, what are the assumptions that, sometimes hidden, sometimes explicit, that go into teaching principles of economics? Uh, Kitty Murphy, Catherine Murphy uh, from the Religious Studies Department is also here, framing a common interest, contexts, strategies, and motives of generosity in early Christianity. So uh, we're going from uh, a couple thousand years ago up to the, to the very present in this group. Laura Nichols, who will be joining uh, me on the podium uh, in a moment uh, to to respond to my comments uh, from the sociology department, working on a project, Education as a Common Good, the role of Catholic colleges in reducing educational and economic inequality in a global context. And uh, Srila Sarkar in the communication department at SCU uh, has a project on technology, global economic development, and questions of the common good. So wide ranging set of uh, topics. You'll be hearing more from us as the coming two years uh, go along. There's the title, What's at Stake for Economic Justice in 2016? Uh, Inequality in Global, National, and Local Perspective. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about the national perspective, uh, in part because that's what candidates tend to talk about, and there's a lot to talk about there, but I do want to try to frame things in a, a broader and also narrower context to the extent possible. Let me start at the beginning, uh, which is with uh, some definitions. I'm not a philosopher, uh, so economic justice is something I come to uh, as a dabbler and an economist. Uh, seems like we should have something to say about economic justice as economists. Uh, I think of economic justice as a fundamentally contested issue in the sense that uh, definitions vary quite a bit from one person to the next. In fact, I have a number of colleagues in the economics profession who would question whether economic justice is even a meaningful term to talk about in the first place. Uh, I'm not among them. Uh, but there are a variety of uh, approaches and definitions ranging from an emphasis on economic liberty and uh, the freedom to choose in a market economy uh, to equality of opportunity, the idea that uh, everyone should have a a level playing field to make uh, their way through the economy 
to those who emphasize more the uh, idea of an equal distribution of outcomes. Um, what has it got to do with, uh, with the common good? And I think Teresa already has uh, put that on the table in a nice way, referring to Catholic social teaching and the, the long tradition of thinking about uh, economic justice in the context of the common good. I come to it as uh, someone from a more secular tradition, um, and I think of uh, the economy itself as a commons. And uh, by commons, I mean it's a shared set uh, inherited from the past, a shared set of human cap capacities, technologies, and institutions, and norms, over which no specific individuals have natural private ownership rights. And therefore, it's a, it's a shared resource in some sense that we, that we have. Justice concerns, to me, the institutional rules and norms by which we allocate goods that flow from this set of uh, this commons uh, of the economy. And uh, in, in the tradition of, of thought that I'm uh, inclined toward, I, I value a lot the views of the philosopher John Rawls. Some of you may be familiar with him, uh, who conceived of justice as fairness. Uh, and a key implication of thinking about justice as fairness is the idea that inequalities in society's basic goods require justification. We can't accept that some people come out uh, with different, uh, vastly different uh, standards of, of living, uh, poverty, inequality, without uh, some justification. And in particular, that we should concern ourselves with the situation of the people who are worst off, what he referred to as the difference principle. And uh, to me, that sounds an awful lot like the, the Catholic uh, emphasis on the preferential option for the poor. And I think they st spring from the same notion that, uh, that we're in this together and that we have to uh, uh, justify uh, differences in economic outcomes. Uh, is it a global commons? So where the theme of the entire uh, Bannon Institute for the coming two years is, the, is uh, you know, is there common good in our common home? And that's actually, to me, a, an interesting and difficult question. It seems natural that our concern for uh, economic justice uh, should extend to all humanity. What is it that would exclude somebody uh, from thinking about that commons? And so when we think about, for example, the preferential option for the poor. It really rightly should be the global poor. On the other hand, uh, this leads to a lot of challenges in thinking about things like poverty. One example would be, uh, you know, what does it take to be considered a person of low income or someone who's poor? In the US, the official poverty line for a family of four is about $24,000 annually. Now, that's a remarkably low number for a family of four to get by on in the United States. It comes down to about $16 a day per person. And about 14.5% of Americans are in that category. Meanwhile, half the people on Earth live on an estimated under $5 per day. So, um, uh, substantially below what we think of as kind of a minimum standard of living in the U.S. setting from, on, in, on official terms. And 15%, an estimated 15% of global citizens uh, get by on less than $2 a day. Um, not to say that this uh, justifies ignoring the problems of poverty as defined in the United States, but just that there are just as concerns need to take place within particular spheres of concern. Um, and it does raise the interesting question of, of if, if and when there might be conflicts between uh, objectives uh, related to economic justice. The campaign uh, for the presidential election in 2016 has, I think, actually been quite interesting in raising a number of uh, economic justice issues. Most of those, if not all of them, have really been within this uh, national sphere of concern rather than global sphere, which is not surprising uh, given the, the typical nature of U.S. national politics. But a number of interesting issues have been raised, and I think in a, in a way that uh, has placed them at, at a higher point of attention than in, in past elections to a degree, at least up until uh, recent uh, turns in the campaign. Some of those issues that have been brought up are the widening inequality between the, the top uh, and the rest, the uh, decades of stagnant wage growth for the middle and lower classes in the United States, and the prospect that uh, the next generation of folks will actually do worse than uh, their parents did on average, uh, concerns about slow employment recovery after the Great Recession of 2008, 
Uh, and a lot of concern, of course, about potential roles of globalization, immigration, and uh, technological change as kind of disruptive forces exacerbating a number of these trends. Now, a lot of the debate has really taken place at a pretty poor level, uh, and uh, recently a, a lot more concerns about just the basic uh, fitness of uh, one or more of the candidates has certainly come to the fore, but uh, I think the, the campaign initially has done a good job sort of at least pointing us to this kind of slow-moving crisis of economic justice in the United States. And I'd like to just take a little time to unpack what I see as some of the uh, major issues along those lines and then say a little bit about what are, might or might not be done about it um, and um, conclude with a few comments about the global and local context. So uh, being an economist, I am uh, prone to showing charts, so you all are going to have to put up with a few charts, but they're good charts, they're great charts, <laughs> they're, they're excellent charts. Um, this one you, is, a, is a famous plot that I suppose, I, I hope many of you have, have seen some version of, which I, I kind of think of as the great U-turn, and this is based on uh, the work of Thomas Piketty and uh, Emmanuel Says, uh, and uh, Piketty, uh, of course, uh, may have got a lot of press for a, a, a long and important book he published recently on this issue of inequality. It shows the top 1% income share in the United States over the past century. So you can see it starts back in uh, 1913 up to nearly the present day. Um, this is the share of total income of Americans going to the top 1% of income earners. And you can see uh, since about the late 1970s there's been a dramatic, really by historical standards, extraordinary increase in income inequality in the United States as measured by this. Uh, from under about 10% as the share of the top 1% in the late 70s, doubling to well over 20% today. And in fact, probably unprecedented, at least by uh, the century for which we have data. Although you can see there was a time about 100 years ago when uh, the, the inequality level was somewhat similar. This ro recent rise over the last three or four decades in income inequality was not expected by economists. Um, in fact, uh, one of the famous generalizations about economic development is the so-called Kuznets curve, which was named for Simon Kuznets, a great mid-century economist, who suggested that the development process in most economies starts with a period of uh, rising income inequality, which then falls off as uh, economies mature. He had no theory that would suggest uh, that it would go back up again, and yet here we are, it's gone back up again dramatically in the United States. Should we care about this um, and how much should we care? There are certainly people who will tell you don't worry about it too much. Gregory Mankiw, a Harvard economist who's quite influential um, and has uh, worked for a number of Republican administrations, suggests that, well, if you're in a market economy, people's incomes reflect their uh, productivity and contributions to the economy. And as a consequence, there's a, a sense in which if these folks are making a lot more money, uh, it's because they're a lot more productive and uh, may deserve what they get. Now, I, I don't have to share that view, but it is a view that one hears. Another view one hears is that, well, it may be that there's a rising concentration at the top, but a rising tide uh, will lift all boats. So at least uh, we can count on economic growth to be pulling up folks who are lower in the income distribution. Um, and um, an interesting feature of our recent experience in the U.S. economy is the extent to which that really is not true, uh, that kind of trickle-down argument. Uh, and this is uh, a, another chart for you, and it shows the median hourly wages of uh, U.S. workers. So median is the person who's right at the middle, earning, you know, if you ranked everybody's wages, the person right at the middle. And it's in constant 2015 dollars, so adjusting for inflation. The uh, dashed line at the top is, is that uh, series for male U.S. workers, starting in the early 70s up to the pre recent times. And uh, the red solid line is, is for women. Um, if you had to pick a graph that might be uh, representing the, the sort of economic or purported economic roots of a lot of Donald Trump's supporters, this might be it, this kind of stagnation over a series, a long series of decades in how the middle uh, of the income distribution is doing. And I should add that uh, it looks no better, if not worse, 
for people who are lower down in the wage distribution. Um, women, you can be happy. You're actually uh, showing some, some improvements in wages over this period of time. Your average raise in real terms has been uh, averaging about a quarter of a percent per year. So you're doing great. Um, not really. Uh, now, so that seems like more bad news. Uh, we're not seeing the rising tide uh, lifting all boats or things trickling down very well to people at the middle. I should say, and would be happy to answer questions, that there, there are... Um, ways in which this is not maybe the best representation uh, if you adjust for certain things there you can get the series to rise very slowly but uh, progress has been uh, very poor to middling for the US middle classes now one more thing we could uh, ask about is how people are doing in terms of mobility so economic mobility might make up for some of the concerns we have if we've got this rising inequality of high incomes at the top but uh, and, and maybe some stagnation at the middle but maybe folks are finding themselves able to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and at least people who start lower in the distribution can move up and unfortunately that's not really uh, happening that much in the US either and um, this is a kind of a complicated picture I really like this graph but you can see there's a lot going on here but let me just try to uh, explain briefly what's going on. Uh, this is placing the US in comparative context with uh, a number of other countries. Each dot represents a country. The horizontal axis there is the Gini coefficient, which is a standard measure of income inequality within a country. And uh, you'll see the US is sort of, you can find it around the middle of the, the, the plot, a little bit up to the right there. And if you look at the other countries in this picture, this is kind of based on data limitations, which, which countries go in there. Uh, the U.S., perhaps not surprisingly, is pretty high on the inequality scale, uh, much higher than countries like Sweden, Norway, and Finland, uh, of course, but also France and Spain. And I don't think anybody would be too surprised about that. Now, what's interesting in this picture is the vertical axis, which uh, goes by the funny uh, title of intergenerational earnings elasticity. Uh, really what it is is a measure of the persistence of income position from one generation to the next. So the higher you are up on the vertical axis, the less chance there is that somebody who starts low in the income scale moves up. So the, this is kind of the opposite of mobility. So high mobility countries are where there's a lot of potential to move up or down the income distribution, and those are the ones lower down. So the U.S. also, by international standards, especially compared to the developed Western economies, actually has uh, lower rates of uh, income intergenerational mobility than other countries. Uh, the fact that this relationship seems to be upward sloping has sometimes been called for reasons I don't quite understand having read the book, The Great Gatsby Curve. And The Great Gatsby Curve suggests that in places where uh, there's less inequality, there is also higher rates of mobility intergenerationally. And you could probably think of lots of reasons why that might be the case. I don't have time to talk about them here. But it raises concerns about what's going on in the United States and suggests that on a lot of these dimensions, the U.S. doesn't look so good uh, from an opportunity or income equality point of view. Why is intergenerational mobility in the country that made Horatio Alger famous uh, so um, unlikely or slow compared to some of our, uh, other, the other countries we might compare ourselves with? And that's a huge issue. In fact, one that's not that well understood, I don't think. But we get some insights by looking at geographical patterns. And this is some really important recent work by a team of uh, economists led by Raj Chetty at Harvard. And what they've done is, is they've kind of measured intergenerational mobility in different parts of the United States. So the redder and darker places in this map are places where there's relatively low op, uh, probability that someone born poor moves up, or that actually their children, uh, the, the, the children of poor people move up uh, the income ladder. And uh, there's a lot to be said about this. The research has pointed up a number of interesting patterns. But I think if you know something about US geography, you know that uh, those areas here are correlated uh, with certain demographic features, in particular areas with uh, large proportions of African Americans, Native Americans, and Latinos, 
And I think this is not uh, entirely surprising either. We have uh, in the United States a number of our inequality and mobility uh, deficits uh, can, in my view, be traced to a history of uh, racial and ethnic discrimination um, and its consequences. Now, that racial divide may help explain why the U.S. has these uh, historical and present patterns of inequality and uh, lack of mobility compared to other countries, but it doesn't really help us explain that recent trend, which seems to be so much uh, towards so much of an increase in inequality. So what's going on, and uh, what do the candidates have to say about it? I wanted to say a little bit about that. Um, my general view is that these kinds of huge historical trends and shifts are likely to have multiple causes, and so there's no time today to get into too much about what those causes might be. But I do want to address one that's come up uh, in the presidential campaign quite a lot, uh, both with the Sanders ca candidacy as well as the Trump candidacy, although I, I, I'm not one of those people who uh, puts those folks in the same, in the same uh, tent. But um, one of those is the role of, of globalization and its consequences. And Donald Trump, I think we can summarize his uh, view of the, the problems associated with globalization as essentially blaming uh, others, the other. And the other for, for Trump, I think, can also be summarized as the Chinese over there and the Mexicans over here, right? So that's kind of the, the Trump position. And, um, you know, that xenophobia and racism, I think, is troubling uh, to, to all of us. But we shouldn't allow it to uh, obscure the element of truth that uh, is in there. Globalization has mattered for U.S. income distribution and the uh, wage, uh, stagnant wage progress of the middle and lower paid workers in our country. And um, it's not just the, uh, the nativists and the socialists who make this claim, but a lot of uh, very uh, mainstream economists have researched this question. Perhaps the most noteworthy is David Otter of MIT, who has shown, I think, using pretty sophisticated and convincing statistical analysis that uh, the competition of low-wage imports from China has definitely been costly to uh, the American workers with whom those products compete. Um, and Donald Trump then is picking up on a, 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 an element of truth and is kind of asserting a nostalgia for an economic world in the United States that has, uh, seems to have disappeared, where there were high-wage, blue-collar jobs um, supporting a kind of what I would think of as a breadwinner economy, um, which uh, is gendered in its own way. Now, that economy, to the extent it ever existed, I don't think is coming back. And, and the reason uh, I don't think so has to do with the fact that a lot of the problems that lower wage workers are encountering in the United States um, are attributed to, attributable to other factors besides or in addition to globalization and in particular changing sectoral patterns in the economy and um, changes in skill demand due to technology and a number of institutional and political trends that have worked to their disadvantage. And I particularly like this quote uh, along these lines from the journalist Benjamin Applebaum of the New York Times, this is from a recent article he wrote, so I'll just uh, quote it uh, at length a little bit here. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there were 64,000 steel workers in America last year and 820,000 home health aides, more than double the population of Pittsburgh. Next year, there will be fewer steel workers and still more home health aides as baby boomers fade into old age. I'm not there yet. Uh, soon we will be living in the United States of home health aides. Yet, the candidates keep talking about steel workers. Many home health aides live close to the poverty line. Average annual wages were just $22,870 last year. If both parties are willing to meddle with the marketplace in order to help one sector, why not do the same for jobs that currently exist? And uh, the point is, uh, I think, quite well taken. Why not indeed? So. That's all a lot of pessimism and uh, could lead to defeatism. I don't think it should. Uh, inequality is not destiny, nor is poverty. There are things that can be done um, in the United States, and we've done it before. And that 
plot that shows inequality falling dramatically, and you would find also that the real wages of uh, blue-collar workers and low-skilled workers were rising over that same earlier period in the century, uh, was done uh, quite successfully. And uh, one could, I'll, could list a, a, a long list of potential policy measures that might be able to get us there. Um, another indication that we, it's not destiny, that inequality is not destiny, is to compare the United States with other countries. I noted the contrast in terms of uh, inequality and mobility. Here's this uh, same great U-turn picture. It's actually slightly different to make it comparable with France. So the U.S. is the dashed blue line, and uh, that's the 1% top income share in the U.S., and the uh, solid red line is France. Now, the fascinating thing about this, and this is uh, thanks to Thomas Piketty and his colleagues that we have this amazing data, is that you can see both countries had very similar paths of top 1% share of kind of the, the rich um, falling in their share of national income in both countries over pretty much the same period. The recent uprise in the United States and a few other countries is uh, unique to us. Um, and that raises the interesting question, what are the French doing um, and, and what are we doing that's different? And I think if we look at this from a policy perspective, the decline in inequality and the rise of better jobs, better paying jobs for Americans as well as the French over the earlier part of the century is correlated in the United States, of course, with the New Deal as well as the Second World War and a number of uh, innovations in politics and uh, institutions that coincided with that, mass unionization, uh, generous minimum wages, social uh, support mechanisms, and in Piketty's view, particularly top tax rates that were uh, quite high uh, on the top income earners. They have remained quite high in France and have uh, come down quite dramatically in the United States during this period of divergence of the two countries. And uh, we could talk uh, about why uh, and how that might matter. Uh, pattern in France is similar in a number of other continental European countries such as Germany and elsewhere. Now, I think the jury is still out on exactly why the U.S. inequality has risen so dramatically, uh, but this is certainly food for thought that suggests there's nothing inevitable about a modern, globalized economy. France has a much higher share of uh, imports and exports than we do as a percentage of GDP. Nothing inevitable about the, these uh, trends that have affected us. Does either of the candidates, major candidates, have a real fix? And I think the answer is no. Uh, we are not talking seriously about the, the dramatic structural changes that have been occurring and will continue to occur in the United States uh, that having to do with economic justice and injustice. And I don't expect uh, that that's going to change anytime soon in this uh, campaign and uh, perhaps not right away. But uh, the issues did come up, and I uh, appreciate that, uh, that Bernie Sanders uh, put these things on the table, and the Democrats are going to have to deal with, uh, with them one way or another. Nonetheless, having said that, the candidates do differ um, to the extent we can discern what uh, Donald Trump's positions are on economic policy. Uh, one thing that they have both laid out is what are their income tax policies, and the tax policies could not be more different from the point of view of uh, income distribution. Uh, Clinton, uh, according to current estimates, her proposed uh, income tax policies would shift the after-tax income of the top 1% down by about 5%. Not a huge, not going to reverse those trends, but would move the needle slightly in the direction of the continental European countries. Donald Trump uh, proposes massive tax cuts across the board, but the large majority of those benefiting the very highest incomes, the top 1% would see after-tax incomes increase by an estimated 15 to 17% or more, everyone else getting uh, much more modest increases. And of course, how they would be paid for is, uh, remains to be seen. I'll say one other thing about the difference between the candidates uh, without dwelling too much on policy wonky uh, analysis here is the safety net. And I think people often underappreciate how important our modest but significant social safety net is in this country. Um, 
there's a growing realization that uh, once we properly account for the full sort set of resources that low-income people have in this country, t transfer and other related uh, tax and transfer policies in the United States uh, go a long way toward reducing uh, the worst kind of low hardship of low-income families. Uh, in particular, you can show uh, that trans major transfer policies, in particular the Earned Income Tax Credit and SNAP, the current food stamps program in the United States, uh, together cut the poverty rate by about half uh, relative to what it otherwise would be um, if you, if you uh, didn't have those in place once we take them into account. And a growing body of evidence by economists, sociologists, and others show that these transfer safety net programs uh, pay off in really important ways for child welfare, health, uh, long-run achievement of people, the prospect of mobility and entering uh, society uh, with a kind of dignified uh, minimum level of lifestyle uh, and well-being. So uh, the fact that uh, at least one of the candidates is talking about modest improvements, strengthening of the social safety net, I think is uh, something we can take some comfort in, although uh, certainly not nearly far enough. Let me return very briefly to the issue of globalization and its, uh, Im its impact on uh, economic justice issues and what to make of all of that. I think this is, you know, has been in the press aside from uh, some of the fitness and character issues, has certainly been one of the major, major campaign uh, issues that has been talked about in the media. Um, what about this problem of global trade affecting uh, American workers? Um, is Trump really on to something with his kind of anti-global populism? Um, even Hillary Clinton has taken a step back from what I would say is her uh, usually reliable support for a pro-globalization elite position. Uh, she's pivoted a bit on this, of course, I think rather unconvincingly on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, TPP, which she's now come out against. I don't expect that that position is necessarily going to survive her, her election um, once all is said and done. I'm um, a uh, 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 I consider myself a person of the left. I'm uh, maybe less a person of the anti-global left than, uh, than a lot of other people I know and uh, admire and respect. I think the biggest concern I have about the, the idea of reversing the movements toward globalization and, uh, and free trade have to do with uh, the, p the potential damage to uh, other countries where globalization has been a mixed bag, certainly, uh, but has been uh, at times a, a force for, for good as well as, as bad. And I guess the position I'd like to uh, uh, suggest to you is one taken by a really thoughtful economist who studies uh, trade issues and trade policy issues, Danny Roderick, uh, who writes the following. Globalization has deepened the economic and cultural divisions between those who can take advantage of the global economy and those who don't have the resources and skills to do so. Native, nativist politicians like Donald J. Trump have channeled the resulting discontent as hostility to outsiders, Mexican or Polish immigrants, Chinese exporters, minorities. We need to rescue globalization not just from the populists but also from its cheerleaders. Globalization evangelists have done great damage to their cause, not just by underplaying the real fears and concerns on which the Trumps of this world thrive, but by overlooking the benefits of a more moderate form of globalization. So I would just urge upon you as you think about this, as you think about the Sanders position, about the Trump position, etc., that we uh, thoughtfully engage in the question of what, not whether globalization, but what kind of globalization, under what rules, um, and uh, under what a degree of national economic sovereignty. And I, I hope that moving forward, once we're beyond this uh, disastrous nativist uh, discourse that has been dominating a lot of the political season, that we can talk about what is this more moderate form of globalization, what does it entail, and, and um, what are we going to do about that. Uh, I want to turn very briefly, because my time is so limited, to bringing this out to a, a global uh, perspective. And I want to just comment on a couple of uh, things, uh, getting the signal here. Um, 
One should uh, extend one's vision beyond the U.S. borders in terms of questions of uh, poverty and inequality, and there is some good news, and I think we shouldn't ignore that. And uh, this is the series from the World Bank of uh, Global Poverty Headcount and uh, Number of uh, Extreme Poor. These are folks who get by on uh, less than $1.90 per person per day. So these are really, really very, very uh, low-income folks around the world. And I, I think that the heartening message here is to note that the orange series, the lower series there, which is the percent of folks in that category, falls from about 35% in 1990 to uh, close to 10% in recent times. Now, I can't help but remark that this is this progress against the deepest kind of poverty on a global scale has been very uneven. And the place that really accounts for uh, a huge portion of this success in the reduction of extreme poverty is precisely the public enemy number one of Donald Trump, besides possibly Mexican immigrants. And uh, that is China. And uh, China is a, a, a very fascinating and uh, contradictory and complex country. But there's no denying an extraordinary success of uh, China in terms of uh, income growth that has lifted large, large numbers of people out of the lowest levels of poverty. Now, interestingly, China, like the United States, has experienced dramatic increases in inequality. There's no question about that either. Uh, but this is real income growth over the uh, 20 year, recent 20-year period, and everybody has been uh, experiencing this in China, both in rural and urban areas, best as we can tell. Lots of problems go along with that, but I use this as perhaps my, my food for thought about the globalization questions and uh, what we should make of our economic relations with China. I'm going to take my last two minutes to say, to bring things down from that uh, very high global level to a very local level. Um, I have taken on as, as my project for this uh, Bannon Institute thinking about local poverty and inequality issues in the Silicon Valley area. And um, uh, I'm struck by recent trends as I think about things like uh, responses to global climate change as well as uh, economic inequality and injustice and poverty, how important local action has become. And partly that's because of the vacuum of uh, dysfunctional national politics. And uh, we'll see what happens in this election. I expect we're still going to have divided government uh, at the national level. Meanwhile, there are so many interesting things going on locally. And I just want to mention a couple of those uh, with, uh, with what little time left. Um, examples where local action can really make a big difference include things like the local minimum wage. And uh, as you may know, the federal, the national minimum wage right now is $7.25 an hour. Uh, California's is $10, but headed up to $15 over the next few years. Um, I like the idea of local political action on the minimum wage, and for two reasons. One is because it's been proven that it can succeed, that we can raise minimum wages in local communities with concerted political effort, but also because different places need different minimum wages. The minimum wage uh, in San Jose that's sensible for San Jose, which I think $15 would not be, uh, would not be a, a, a bad thing, is not necessarily the right minimum wage for rural Mississippi or rural Iowa, where equilibrium wages in the market are so much lower. And in fact, uh, maybe the legal minimum wages need to be lower in those places. And that has a lot to do with local cost of living, not so much uh, as the, the wages themselves. And, and I think there's a lot of uh, interesting research to suggest that, that kind of argument. Uh, affordable housing is another thing that's quite hot this political season in the local community. And uh, this is another area where places like Silicon Valley, which seems so prosperous, so wealthy, in fact, maybe the wealthiest place on the planet, uh, also experience extraordinary levels of real poverty because of uh, extraordinarily high housing costs. And here's another area where we can mobilize politically to make uh, important changes. I'm not always in agreement with uh, what some of the, uh, the political movements uh, push for in areas like housing um, and other things, but uh, that's the kind of political discourse that in this election season it would be really nice to see, and I think we're engaging in it locally. 
I'm optimistic we can get some things done, and then we can all uh, hope and vote for uh, change we can believe in at the uh, national level as things move forward. So I will close with that, and uh, thank you very much, and uh, hand it over to my colleague, uh, Professor Nichols. And thank you. Uh, Laura is uh, a professor of sociology in the uh, sociology department at, at Santa Clara University. I should have a text to read from. She's uh, been an active uh, person in local, local poverty issues and uh, no doubt will address some of those concerns in, in her talk. She also happens to be the current director of the undergraduate core curriculum uh, here. So all you undergrads, uh, if you have complaints about the core, you can talk to Laura. So uh, I look forward to hearing her comments and leaving time for us to have some interesting exchange uh, afterwards, question and answers from you all. So Laura Nichols. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Teresa and the Ignatian Center. And um, I'm really excited about having this opportunity uh, to work together with this group for the next two years. So um, I'm just going to add a few other ideas to Bill's presentation. Um, I don't really have curves. I got a couple of charts, though, so hopefully you like that. Um, I think it is instructive to look at the United States um, and to look at things that have been happening uh, in the United States context because we are a country that has moved through industrialization into a more advanced capitalist economy today. And I think there are many communities globally that are going through that transition right now. And so thinking about what that means and what that experience was like here in the United States, I think can prove uh, useful for us. Um, I think if we're serious about economic justice, we really need to directly address capitalism and not be scared to do so. Uh, we need to see it for the system that it is. It is perhaps the best system uh, to have in a time of globalization and with the size of the numbers of people we're talking about globally in the world. But it has its strengths and it has its weaknesses. Uh, and I think by doing this we can probably, by taking on some issues related to capitalism, we can influence the shape of economic development globally. So let's just take a trip down memory lane about what, how inequality does develop uh, during industrialization and what it's looking like in the U.S. today. So we know as communities have moved from rural to urban areas, um, there's oftentimes movement from a culture of cooperation to more one of competition. And as economies develop over time, we start seeing things like this. Um, we see inequality in the middle of poverty, such as expensive houses being built in the middle of a community of modest dwellings, or squatter communities that develop around cities. This is often what our students see when they go on immersion trips and summer fellow programs uh, to countries that are increasingly influenced by a globalized economy. In the U.S., we also are seeing other types of things happening, such as gated communities, and also great differences in the resources and quality of public schools, often just a few miles from each other. But these great differences have created great stratification and inequality uh, by social class. And we see geographic divisions between people, both locally in our local community, but also between communities. So if we look at you know, Silicon Valley compared to the Central Valley where I grew up, just a few hours from here east, um, very different economic realities. And this is what we have developed um, towards. However, while there does, as Bill said, I, I do believe too, local level still has hope uh, that policies uh, can do things to maybe make things a bit more just uh, for everyone. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm not feeling too good about putting my economic future and the economic future of my offspring into the hands of national politicians. Um, we have a system where the party power changes very frequently with each election sometimes, and differing ideologies approach issues like inequality and poverty in a very piecemeal fashion. So even the things, you know, Clinton has probably most directly uh, proposed things very recently to address uh, poverty such as the child tax credit, 
Um, it definitely will be helpful, but still, again, it's a very piecemeal fashion. So if we really do want to address inequality for the benefit of all of us, I think there's probably three main things, and there are additional things, but they build off what Bill uh, talked about that we really do need to focus on. The first thing we'll need to wrestle with at the federal level that could have an impact globally is what happens with people who cannot engage in paid work in a capitalist economy. As Bill said, we can certainly do more for the working poor, but we also have to address the issue of children, caretakers, and those with disabilities. So right now in the United States, we have 14.5 million children who are living in poverty. And in 2013, 51% of children in our public schools also were in poverty. Now that's, again, based on the federal poverty line that Bill talked about, 25,000 for a family of four. And we know in Silicon Valley that 25,000 does not guarantee housing stability or food uh, security. So these kind of conditions are putting all of our futures at risk. But as Bill mentioned, you know, we don't necessarily have to uh, put up with that uh, reality if we don't want to. And if we want to address the issue, one thing that we can learn from is our history um, of poverty among those over age 65. And so we know at one point in history, and uh, there are estimates actually, that if we didn't have Social Security, our poverty rate of those over age 65 could be as high as 40% uh, as right now. Although it's hard, to, it's hard to predict those kind of things because we don't know how much people might save uh, if, there was, if they knew there was no Social Security. But um, that red line up there decreased because strengthening Social Security benefits as well as Medicare. And because the older generations rely on the younger generations um, for these public benefits, we really are uh, tied to one another in terms of our futures. So that high proportion, uh, just under 20% of those under age 18, uh, I think is a real concern and issue for us in the United States. The second thing um, is looking at wealth inequality, and Bill talked about uh, income inequality, and I worry a little bit more about wealth inequality than income inequality. Um, perhaps you've seen this study uh, by Norton and Airley, and they asked people what they thought the ideal distribution of wealth should be in the United States. That's the bottom bar there. Um, and then they asked them what they estimated it really was like. And you'll see for the ideal, they gave the top 20% about 32% of the wealth and then thought that ideally it should be distributed among the other social classes. Uh, they estimated that the top 20%, now wealth, we're talking about things beyond income. So we're talking about savings, value of house, other kinds of things that people might um, own. So they estimate the top 20% probably had about 55% of the wealth. But in actuality, the top 20% have almost 85% or 82% of all the wealth. And we notice that the lower two classes aren't even represented on the top bar there. They don't have wealth. They are in debt. And so this is a concern because, of course, we know how capital and wealth works, and it attracts more wealth and capital. So this is certainly an issue that I'm sure that you've been hearing some about um, and that we'll probably need to, to deal with if we want to um, change things. Now, why is wealth important? Well, one reason why wealth is important is what's happening right here at our fine institution, which is students needing to go to college. Uh, the estimate is that the future careers um, over the next five years, about 67% of them will require some kind of education beyond high school. And um, the United States in 1995, we were first in terms of the proportion of our young adults, those under age 34, who had a bachelor's degree. And right now we're sitting at about 12. We've had many countries who have surpassed us. And um, the Obama administration has put in some initiatives, provided some funding to try and encourage uh, growth in uh, accomplishment of bachelor's degree among a higher proportion of our young adults, and we haven't seen much movement uh, at all. And part of what explains it is this chart right here, which is looking at uh, social class and likelihood of receiving a bachelor's degree. And when I started looking into these data, I actually, I knew that there was some class effect, but I was quite surprised actually to see uh, that third quartile group right there, 
that's probably many of us in the middle class or upper middle class. Um, only 37% of students who come from that family economic background are uh, accomplishing a bachelor's degree within eight years of high school. So wealth, of course, is the thing that helps us pay for college and graduate debt-free. It's also the thing that allows us to buy a house maybe for the first time in an expensive housing market like Silicon Valley. So wealth and its distribution matters. It particularly matters at a time like now when the cost of tuition has gone up uh, so dramatically and our supports for that, public supports at the federal level, uh, have not. In fact, they have decreased over time. And so what this chart shows is that uh, back in 1975, a Pell Grant, which is the federal financial aid program for students who are low income, um, covered about 67% of the average college tuition. Now, it covers only about 25%. This is counting both public as well as private um, schools. So we know that Pell Grants are covering a very small proportion and students have to make up uh, a much larger uh, proportion of uh, the tuition of going to college. So we need to decide as a country if we're going to start uh, funding uh, college or higher education training uh, for uh, our students if we're going to put resources into that. Many countries that are on Bill's chart with, that have uh, more uh, economic mobility, that's what they do. And so I think that's something we are going to face even though we know it's going to be an expensive uh, thing to wrestle with. All right, but I do think that colleges such, of our, such as ours can make a difference um, in this realm. Um, first of all, uh, we are places of ideas. And if we can bring together people, hopefully across social classes, uh, both people who are working at our institutions as well as our student body, I think we can come together and have a collective impact on um, on these issues and questions of economic justice. Participatory budgeting uh, projects, participatory action, uh, different kinds of projects and governance and democracy uh, are growing around the world and there's certainly things that we could use here. And certainly we could leverage social media. Uh, we can incentivize companies who create jobs that contribute to human flourishing as well as the flourishing of our planet. So there's a lot potentially that we um, can do. But I think we need to do it collectively, and we need to come together, and we need to wrestle with these ideas. Yes, there's, we have extreme positions, but I think we can do it better than the politicians. Are you with me? Do you think? I think so. I think at this point, uh, I think we could, we could pull something off, and I think we can come together without throwing away the things that we most cherish and we don't want to lose, which I think free enterprise uh, is one of those but um, I think from a collective perspective, and I think our institutions have something to say about that. So if you have time for some further reading, I have two books that I recommend. Um, this is really looking at poverty in the United States, particularly from those who um, are experiencing the deepest poverty. And then also, this is a recent report that came out um, from the a Jesuit Curia in Rome, and it does take a global perspective, but has very specific uh, policy recommendations. Uh, for the future. So I know that we put a lot of information out there on you, but yay, now we have time to hear back from you. So um, we're going to take questions. I think there's, you can stand up so we can see you, and Bill's going to come to the front also, and we'll take any questions that you have. Questions, please. Okay. Okay. Questions, comments. Yes. Mike is coming. Uh, thank you both for an outstanding program. Uh, Bill, could you rank? in your opinion, the major causes of income inequality in the United States. You mentioned several, uh, 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 globalization being uh, front and center, but another one could be tax policy. Uh, a third is uh, lack of any effective fiscal policy. Thank you. Oh, golly. <laughs> um, that's a great question. So what's, 
I, I think in, in my mind, I kind of um, think about different dimensions of the rise of inequality and um, so they, they have different causes. So, so let me say, you know, there's, there's the, the rise of inequality that is the stagnation of folks at, in the lower half, say, of the income distribution. Why haven't uh, those wages increased? Um, and, and there I think it's a combination of some kind of economic context factors, uh, global competition in uh, manufacturing goods, and uh, technological change that has created um, uh, less demand for low-skilled workers. I guess among those, I, I tend to think the technology effects are uh, likely to be uh, larger, as well as uh, some political factors such as the declining real value of the minimum wage and the decline of labor unions. I have a tough time sort of deciding among those uh, what the relative contributions are. I think they're all uh, significant contributors um, I guess the one that, 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 that concerns me most right now is thinking about the implications of uh, technological changes for uh, working uh, people, which is uh, a huge issue. The rise of concentrated inequality at the very top, uh, to me, uh, I'm somewhat convinced by uh, Piketty's argument that there's a lot of this has to do with how we uh, tax folks at the very high end. Uh, in addition, there have been a number of changes in the structure of the economy that have been very favorable to the concentration of uh, income at the top. Those are things like um, what we call winner-take-all markets where the, the person who ends up dominating the market, Microsoft uh, is a classic example, uh, ends up winning a huge, huge uh, fortune and uh, those who came out a little bit behind uh, end up with, with much less. Now many of those things are exacerbated by public policy such as intellectual property protections. So uh, even there there's a complex mix of uh, public policy and technology changes. Um, but I think at, at that top end those are the two things that uh, I think are most substantial. I'll leave it at that. Um, Too many charts. <laughs> Don't ask about the charts. <laughs> Any? Uh, go ahead, Michelle. Um, so I was listening to your talk. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was listening to your talk and staring at this poster, which is now up behind you. And so in answer to the question, is there a common good in our common home, I just now think no. Uh, there isn't. We have a common home, but the access to something that might be called a common good is so profoundly disproportionate that it seems to me it doesn't exist. So then I'm drawn to the bottom, a uh, summons to solidarity, um, which uh, you in particular uh, sort of invoked, Laura. And so here's my question to sort of bring it back to the context of what's happening uh, politically now. So. It, it seems as if uh, you know Trump's appeal to his supporters has absolutely nothing to do with uh, policy, um, economic or, or anything else. It has everything to do with feeling um, and mostly anger and resentment, especially amongst his supporters uh, who tend to you know sort of come from rural working class white um, communities. Um, and he sort of harnessed that anger and resentment and directed it at racial others, despite the fact that um, they may share some real concerns around issues of economic equality with those others. So my question is, do you see a way forward to create some kind of solidarity across racial uh, lines amongst those who are uh, poor or economically disadvantaged? I'm going to say yes. I'm going to be an optimist today, I've decided. Um, I hear everything that you're saying, and I agree with you, although um, I think, and given what Bill said, I think the working class and middle class have reason to be angry and upset and emotional. 
um, because of their economic situation. And I think the structure that we have has really set up um, that situation. The way it is getting acted out on certain groups of people, I think is problematic that that has been riled up. And that's a very easy thing to do is to get people to turn against each other instead of looking at the real structural issues that have occurred. But I think there are a lot of local community communities, and actually Chris Bacon is here and he talked about some of his work uh, last week, who really come out of a, um, a communal sense of taking care of one another within communities and between communities. I think, I hope, if we can appeal at that level first and we can start building our common interest around those kinds of things, then things could get better. Um, but if you do go to the Central Valley even, not that far away from here, it feels like a very different political as well as economic reality there. And so um, I don't know if I'm exactly addressing your question, but I do have hope that I think that we potentially could. It is a, an extreme problem that things have been raised to a level of um, feels like dangerous proportions. Um, that part, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if I can be an optimist about that. I guess I'm hoping that is a fringe that the media is covering for the most part, and that when it comes right down to talking one-on-one -on -one with people, that uh, there is a chance that there is some kind of solidarity that could be built. Um, I'll just uh, just add that I, I think it, it may be instructive, and I'm, I'm not actually certain of this, to look at the history of, for example, working people's movements. Um, the U.S. history there is, uh, is a kind of a mixed bag. Uh, the, the kind of racism that we are unfortunately accustomed to in the U.S. Uh, political and social setting, uh, certainly our labor movements were not immune to that. Uh, but there have been some very, I think, uh, promising success stories of, of folks organizing uh, across racial and ethnic and gender lines uh, historically. And I, I think it's going to take a, a wide range of kind of community as well as uh, perhaps interest group organizing. And that's something I think a lot of Americans have kind of lost the, uh, the uh, experience and, and expertise at. Um, and uh, we'll see whether that's uh, regained. I would say one thing about Donald Trump supporters, uh, I think they're on average uh, higher income than Hillary Clinton's supporters. So I think, can, you know, I think we have an impression that there are these angry, uh, low-wage white males who are the, the core of his support. And um, I think there's probably a lot of uh, angry, uh, low-wage white males who are not too happy with, with Donald Trump either. So uh, it, it's a matter of mobilizing um, a political kind of will to, to reframe the issues away from those very divisive politics. And, and I, I, I have no idea how to do that, but um, it would be instructive to look at, at some of our uh, past success stories and, and see whether they represent potential models. Any students before I? Back there? Yeah, this one's uh, mostly for Professor uh, Nichols. Um, and it revolves around what like us students can do. Because for me, I'm a junior engineer. And this program revolves a lot around these economic policies, talking about this global market, and I really don't know anything about it. Um, and I haven't had an opportunity to take any classes about it, and just through engineering, I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel to learn about it. And so, I was wondering if there's, you know, any change that could be made to the core curriculum to help educate I or me and other students in these things. Oh, the core question. Well, I I was. I would hope that our different classes that we already have in the core um, would expose you to this, but if not, then it sounds like that's a notation for the next core that gets developed. Um, but be, I, I wouldn't give up just at the college level. There's lots of groups that you can join. Um, and after you graduate, I hope you are very involved in your local community because certainly the experience of engineers um, when combined 
with um, the knowledge of local communities can really be harnessed to have some exciting things happen. And I know the School of Engineering uh, does a lot of things around that, um, but also local community organizations. Like we have packed people acting in community together here, which is a PICO organizing group. So you might want to look for a PICO kind of group in the community where you live um, to do that. Yeah, I think that's the on campus. I graduated from here in the dark ages, uh, and the um, number of programs that I read about in the alumni and the paper about the students working in Mexico uh, and in poorer communities uh, of even doing things like showing people how to make three wheel uh, bicycles so that they could carry crops from the fields into the marketplace, uh, just learning basic carpentry and welding, uh, pure water systems, uh, uh, pit toilet projects, the number of, th of concrete things that have been done with, uh, in some of the immersion programs that have been, are available on campus now, I think would, uh, should apply to him. I think we're gonna take one more question, uh, right here. Yeah, you. <laughs> um, this is more for Professor Sandstrom. I was wondering if you could expand on, you mentioned how like the top percentage uh, having the increase in their share of the wealth and how economists like May and Q of Harvard have said that it's maybe due to them just becoming more productive. Um, I was just wondering if you could expand on that. Do you think there's any validity to that or is it sort of just a cop out for ignoring the larger problem of growing inequality? Well, that's a great question. Um, I don't know that uh, we could rule out that there are uh, economic changes having to re relate it to things like uh, I mentioned, the technology of um, kind of network technologies where there is a tendency for a winner to dominate the market. Uh, entertainment businesses, uh, you know, why is it that we now all listen to the, you know, the, the, the top artists? It's because we have access to uh, you know, sort of universal technologies that allow us to listen to uh, you know, the very best person. We can watch the very best tennis player or actor. And uh, those, are, those are technologies that have concentrated the ability of people to, uh, if they're at the very top of their field, earn lots of money. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's something to be said for the possibility that, that to some degree these concentrations of income relate to productivity differentials. On the other hand, there's a lot of evidence of what economists refer to as uh, economic rents at the top. And an economic rent is uh, an income you gain from uh, being the owner of a scarce resource. And being the owner of a scarce resource may not be due to anything you did that's uh, productive necessarily, but because you have a particular property right over, say, a patent or a copyright, say, a, a pharmaceutical product, uh, or uh, a copyright over a particular piece of um, music or, or software. Um, or that you've figured out ways to game the, the tax system uh, to your advantage. So I, I think we see a mix of this. To me, uh, you know, even if it were true, uh, what Professor Mankiw says, that every single dollar of those earnings uh, were accruing because of some correlation to the person's productivity in the economy, this still raises the question of, um, you know, to what extent uh, is that a deserved advantage um, and to what extent do we have other competing interests in a, in a just economy to, uh, to move some of those resources to, to those in greater need? So I, I, I think actually it's a, it's a wonderful question. It's a good thing for, for young uh, uh, economists and social scientists to think about is, you know, could, could we say what's really going on there? And I think that the jury's still out, but uh, a lot of it has to do with incentives created by uh, the tax system as well as some of these technological factors. And I'll, I'll leave it with that very hedgy, uh, non-committal response. <laughs> well, thank you both for your very um, layered and nuanced um, invitation today to enter into these rather large um, issues of economic justice and injustice in our country and more broadly. Um, I know that you, you leave us with a heavy charge but also we're grateful for the ways in which your work, I think I join your hopefulness um, 
Laura, in the, the space of the uni of a university like Santa Clara and what our charge is within this room and um, at this table. So thank you for your research and also your call to social action relative to the concerns that you raised today. Um, I leave with this, this underline from Francis that says, when these values, he's referencing the dignity of the human person and the pursuit of the common good, when these values are threatened, a prophetic voice must be raised. And I'm grateful for you joining um, and calling us to that today. So thank you very much for all that you contributed. Um, a couple announcements. First, evaluations. There's a um, cards that I think that each of you have. We appreciate your feedback on this series. So if you could just take a minute to give us um, your um, review from today and any suggestions that you might have, either on paper or in um, your email box. If you RSVP'd for today, you'll have an electronic version of that. That would be very helpful. And uh, announcement in our fourth and final um, segment in this series that will be coming up October 25th, so in this coming Tuesday, with Sharmila Lydia from the Department of Women's and Gender Studies and Stephanie Wildman from the School of Law considering what's at stake for gender justice in 2016, rethinking gender and the politics of the possible. So we hope that you can join us back here in this room um, next Tuesday at four o'clock for that event. And for now, I thank you very much for coming and ask you to help me thank our presenters.